Hello and welcome to the first installment of a new video series I'm going to be doing in order to, you know, keep content going. But also, this is an idea I've had for a while. I'd love to be able to review every single Doctor Who story. Indeed, I am still going on with Doctor Who in 10 seconds, but they're a bit more comedic. I've done my bottom five video, there's my Cybermen video coming up, but I thought there's going to be a lot of stories in there that I miss out. So I've decided to use my friend Nathan's website, therandomizer.net. And I'm going to be choosing random Doctor Who stories and just giving you a quick overview, quick review of each one, and my score at the end as well. These will be really short videos, so you can sort of dip in and out, and if you're new to Doctor Who, or if there's lots of old stuff you haven't seen, this might give you a bit of an idea. Obviously, a spoiler warning is in effect for these, but... You know, I'm not going to put it up front and centre, I'll talk about the story a bit more first. So without any further ado, let's get on with picking our first story, which is... The Horns of Nymon! <laughs> if you want to be surprised by Doctor Who, try a rapid randomizer review! That's very odd. What a story to start on. Okay, so The Horns of Nymon was made in 1979, broadcast went slightly over into 1980, and it was unexpectedly the finale to Doctor Who's 17th season. Uh, the finale itself, Sharda was hit by industrial action and was left semi-completed, but we're not talking about Sharda today, we're talking about The Horns of Nymon. So, uh, the Horns of Nymon is a bit of a polarising story in fandom because it's kind of played for comedy. The monster designs are okay, but they're very obviously men in suits. There's big sort of gaps between the headpiece and uh, the body. There is a lot of slapstick comedy in the story, which a lot of people don't like. There is a villain whose performance is... I think wonderfully unhinged. Personally, this is a story I really rather like, but I do acknowledge its problems. Tom Baker is the Doctor and is sort of at the height of his clowning self in this. Indeed, the following year his performance would be massively reined back in and given a much more sombre tone. So this is the last chance to see Tom Baker in sort of full, silly, slapstick, comedic flight. But that doesn't mean that he is wacky for the entire story. He is given some very fine moments of conflict with the villains in this story. Now, the main villain is Soldeed, played by Graham Crowden, who, as I said, <laughs> is given some real comedy to do, but at the same time, he does kind of take it seriously. There is a seriousness and indeed a tragedy to his character. And what really works about the character is he doesn't realise how much of a joke he is. He's given a sort of straight man foil in his subordinate Sorak, who sort of gives Soldeed some looks like uh, he's not quite sure that he really trusts the sanity of his leader, and you're left with the impression at the end of the story that he might take over the planet, but run it a bit more interestingly and a bit more fairly. Uh, the real villains, of course, are the Nymons. They are if you like, a stand-in for Minotaurs. This is a space-age retelling of the Minotaurs and the Cretan Labyrinth myth. We've got uh, Seth instead of Perseus, and Tika, who is played by Blue Peter presenter, and Sophie Ellis Baxter's mum, Janet Ellis. <laughs> How cool is that? Um, and, you know, they're nice enough, they're a bit wet. T the nice thing is Tika is the one who's very gung-ho and Seth is actually not terribly sure of himself. He's told lies saying he's his big hero and now he has to live up to it. And there is something really sweet about that story. Which brings us to the real champion of this story and that is Lala Ward's Romana. As Romana, Lala Ward sort of becomes a doctor in training and there's kind of a subtle character arc which will culminate next year in her becoming a fully fledged, if you like, fully trained Time Lord who goes off to have her own adventures. But this is the first really strong indication of that, in that Romana 
actually has her own sonic screwdriver. She's the one who starts inspiring a rebellion. She's the one who goes massively toe-to-toe -to -toe with the villains in this story and lectures them and tells them how wrong they are and how stupid they are. Romana is the Doctor in this story and that's part of the reason that the Doctor himself is kind of a bit more of a comedic foil because this is Romana's story where she's pushed to the front and Lala takes it so seriously. She sells us the threat. Without her, this thing could have descended into massive farce. There are certainly elements of farce. There's uh, literally the Doctor running through shot one way, fooling the guards and running through shot again the other way. But Lala Ward plays it completely straight. And yeah, this story is worth watching just for her. To be honest, I'd probably give it a 6 out of 10. The production work isn't necessarily that great, and sometimes the over-the-top elements of the performances go too far. My dreams of conquest! <laughs> but this also went out in December. This is Doctor Who at Christmas. The classic series didn't do much with Christmas, but this one feels deliberately Christmassy. And yeah, even though it's only a 6 out of 10, put it on if you're looking for something fun to watch.